my name is Crystal Cordell. I'm one of the surgical pathology fellows. And I decided to do a topic that I'm really interested in, which is cervical dysplasia. And it might seem like a simple topic, but we've come a long way over the last 150 years or so. So I have no disclosures. And my objectives today are to go over the history of cervical cancer screening, as well as the pathogenesis, as well as how we diagnose it, both on cytology as well as histology, the utilization of P16 immunohistochemistry, HPV molecular testing, and to get an idea, to give an idea of where the future of cervical cancer screening is heading currently. So just some background information. Um, in the 1940s, cervical cancer was a leading cause of death in childbearing women. It was said to be the second most common cause of death in the 1940s. But between 1955 and 1992, the death rate significantly declined by approximately 70%. And it is currently now the, most, uh, the 14th most common cancer in women. So why the decline in the rates of death from cervical cancer? It was because of the invention of George Papanikolaou. But uh, um, these are current um, data on the incidence of cervical cancer in the world. Um, as you can see here in the U.S., it's really low. It's less than 7.9 per 100,000 women. In other parts of the world where they don't have the screening that we have in the U.S., it's much higher, say, in Africa and in parts of Central and South America. But just to talk a little bit about George Papanikolaou. So George pa Papanikolaou um, was born and raised in Greece. Um, when he was growing up, he wanted to be a seaman. He wanted to be a seller, but you know, life hit him hard, and he decided to go into the family business and become a doctor like his dad. Uh, he went to the University of Athens, and he studied biological sciences but that was in his infancy in Greece, so he decided to come here to the United States and New York to set up shop and to start a career here. Um, it had been known since about the 1880s that dysplasia caused cervical cancer, and that was discovered by Sir John Williams. Uh, George Papanikolaou wanted to see if he could test for dysplasia or the pre-malignant cells, at first, he started using guinea pigs and testing vaginal fluid from guinea pigs, and, and he noticed that these pre-malignant cells were indeed in the fluid and could be smeared on the slide. So then he decided maybe we could do this in women as well. So in 1928, while in Michigan, he announced his findings at a medical conference, and like a lot of changes in medicine, there is a lot of skepticism and so he had a couple of publications between 1928 and in the 1950s, but the medical community kind of, you know, spurned him until two gynecologists got involved. And by 1952, it was um, accepted as a treatment for women. Um, and key to this was the publication of the Atlas of Exfoliative Cytology in 1954 that he published. And George Papanikolaou himself was one of the first people who would go around the United States and teach people how to diagnose dysplasia using cytology. And he actually worked until the day he died because he, he wanted to make sure clinicians used this life-saving technology. And unfortunately, George Papanikolaou did not receive a Nobel Prize because there was another physician who came up with similar findings approximately six months before he did, but used a different technology. So just a little bit about the pap smear. So the pap smear is called a smear because uh, the conventional pap smear, you literally smear cells on the slide. Um, the stain has pretty much stayed the same, and there's different formulations of the stain. Basically, uh, there's hemotoxylin that stains the nuclei. The orange G gives uh, the keratin an orange look. So, like, if there's squamous cell carcinoma, the orange G is going to um, show up as orange if it's keratinizing. ES and Y stains the superficial squamous cells, the nucleoli, cilia, and red blood cells, and light green SF or fast green FSF stains the cytoplasm of other cells. So the PALP uh, smear itself has 
fairly moderate to low sensitivity at 30 to 80 percent, but the specificity is very high at 94 percent. So currently, um, and since 2008, it's been standard practice in the United States to use liquid-based cytology. The last holdoffs on um, using conventional smears were actually the VA system and the prison systems, but I think even they have switched over to liquid-based cytology now. So there's two different methods of collection. There's the thin prep and the sure prep. So the thin prep, which is what we use here, is a methanol-based procedure that was first FDA approved in 1996. The machine itself, um, there's two different machines. Um, the thin prep 2000, you make one slide at a time, and it uses a filter system. Basically, the filter can, the machine can can sense when the filter is completely covered by a thin layer of cells, and at that moment, the filter then touches to the slide, and then the slide's complete. Um, but there is another thin prep machine called the 3000 that can stain up to 80 slides, and the sample is created on a 20 millimeter uh, diameter. The SurePath um, liquid-based cytology is an ethanol-based system. Uh, the machine itself can create up to 48 slides at a time, and it uses density centrifugation. Um, and, the, and the circle of the sample is a lot smaller, it's 13 millimeters. Of course, there are pros and cons for both systems. Uh, the thin prep is usually more of a monolayer, and the sure path can be a little bit more three-dimensional. And the, the machine used for sure, sure path is known to have a, it's high maintenance. The tubing will clog. So, I mean, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. And I have this image here on the right of the different preparations made in the cytology lab. And I'd like for you to pay attention to the one, the three in the top right corner. Um, the one immediately to the right is a conventional smear. And you can see how when you smear uh, cells directly on a slide, this is really difficult to read. And there's a lot of pathologists that were thrilled when we moved to liquid-based cytology. The one in the middle with the smaller circle is the sure path, and the one to the left of that is the thin prep, which again is what we use here. So just a little bit about the pathogenesis. So uh, again, it's been known for a while that there is a continuum of dysplasia leading to cancer. And since about the 1980s, there were theories that maybe a virus causes, uh, but it wasn't until later that we discovered that it's caused by a human papillomavirus, and it essentially causes, causes all cases of cervical carcinoma. So HPV is a polyomavirus. It typically infects epithelial surface of the mucosa or the skin. When it infects the mucosa, it tends to be oncogenic, uh, and the skin is non-oncogenic. So these are like your, your warts that you have on your skin. Um, those typically don't have a less likelihood to turn it into cancer than if it affected the mucosa, say, in the transformation zone of the cervix. So the prevalence um, is fairly high. 40% of uh, people in the United States have had HPV. Um, it is equally found in women and in men but it's easier to test for in women than it is in men. So in men, it, it could go completely unnoticed. Um, of course, the prevalence is age dependent. Uh, the highest rates are going to be in those between the ages of 20 to 24, and the lowest rates are in your teenagers because uh, they're probably less likely to have exposure to HPV, as well as in, in older Americans. And so, the other thing to note is that HPV is the most common STD in the world. So there are over 200 strains of HPV that have been characterized, and we divide them into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And they are differentiated by the L1 gene encoded in viral capsid. So the reason why we divide it into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk is um, because of the risk of developing cancer. So your l low risk uh, HPV, it's like your 6 and 11, uh, will lead to l cell, but they're a lot less likely to lead to a high-grade dysplasia or carcinoma. 
whereas your high-risk subtypes uh, have an increased chance of causing HCL and carcinoma. And in fact, most cases of high-grade dysplasia and carcinoma, patients have HPV 16 or 18, which are your high-risk subtypes. The intermediate subtypes are ones that can com become either low-grade or high-grade or cancer. So they're intermediate. Over the years, there's been multiple different HPV testing platforms. Most of them are for research purposes only, but this list are the ones that are FDA approved. The first one that was approved was the Digene Hybrid Capture 2, and I will talk about that later in my presentation, as well as the COBUS HPV test. So how do we diagnose dysplasia? First, I'm going to go over cytology. So Papanicolaou, who came up with the, the test for uh, dysplasia in the cervix, came up with the nomenclature as well. So he had a system where he divided it into five classes. So class one was normal cells, class two inflammatory, class three was suspicious, class four was strongly suggestive, and class five was definitely malignant. Um, but in the 1940s, toward the end of the 1940s, um, we switched over to mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia, severe dysplasia, and carcinoma in situ. And then we went to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia system, which is a hybrid of what we use now, the SIN1, SIN2, SIN3, and squamous cell. Um, and the Bethesda reported system for cytology um, Actually, the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia system is kind of a hybrid of what we use in histology, but for cytology, we use the Bethesda reporting system, which is NILM, which stands for negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, L-cell, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, H-cell, high-grade squamous, squamous intraepithelial lesion, and squamous cell carcinoma. And this is kind of like a basic bet that's a reporting system because there's other categories as well. This is just concerning uh, dysplastic plastic lesions within the squamous component only. So some examples of cytology, um, what you would find with low-grade dysplasia. So in the upper left corner, we see some cells kind of off to the right where the black arrow is pointing to where the nuclei are greater than three times the size of those of the intermediate cells, which are um, the blue cells that, uh, in D, you can see them sort of on the left-hand corner. Um, so this is your typical intermediate cell. And the ones in the upper left, the nuclei are over three times as much, and you have this cleared-out space around the nucleus that's um, a halo. Uh, in the panel B, you also see some nuclear irregularity, which is one of the things you can find with l cell as well as hyperchromasia. And C is just an example of what we would see on histology, and this just confirms that even on histology, if we're lucky, we can still make out the halos, and we see the hyperchromasia as well as the increase in nuclear size and nuclear irregularities. And the panel, panel D is just to point out that not all halos are those of l cell or the coilocytes. So this, this halo that's seen in D, it's small, is uh, not nuclear, uh, it's not optically clear. Uh, this, the nuclei itself is smooth. So this is a reactive halo, and actually the clear arrow points out to the, the cause of why this is reactive. That's Canada. And I just thought this was a better picture of what a typical coilocyte um, looks like. So again, on the left, we have uh, our normal intermediate cells, and we use the nuclei of the intermediate cells to compare for size in cytology. And on the right, we can clearly see that this nuclei is at least four times greater than the one on the left. We have this cleared out space, um, which is the halo formation caused by the presence of HPV. And in this lower cell in this group, you can see two nuclei, which you shouldn't see. And that binucleation is another common sign, finding with L cell as well. So just to talk about high grade or H cell, 
these can these cells are atypical and they can occur either singly or in hyperchromatic crowded groups. And what I'm showing you here is more of the single disbursement in A. Uh, these are large cells with an increase in C ratio. They're hyperchromatic with very irregular nuclear borders. On B, uh, it's just an example of how, if you're not careful, these are easy to miss because they're going to be in the background of your normal superficial and intermediate cells kind of dispersed between. So if you ever see any individual cells dispersed between, intermediate and, and superficial cells always pay attention because it could be a high grade. And C is another example um, of H cell, and D is what we see on the histology. So we have, even on histology, we can see these cells with increased NC ratio. And the arrow points to a mitosis that's in the upper third as well, and I'll get to that in a minute. So this is one of the hyperchromatic crowded groups um, that you would see in an H, uh, H cell. And again, the, the NC ratio is high and you see irregular uh, nuclear border, borders. And the last category I really want to talk about in cytology is kind of the wastebasket of cytology. And that's ASCAS, or atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, which basically means uh, we think it's a little abnormal, but we can't definitely say it's low grade or high grade. So the example in A shows um, slightly increased nuclear size. So if the, the nucleus is 2.5 to 3 times the size of an intermediate cells, cell, that's ASCIS. Um, you can also have atypical parakeratosis, which falls under the category of ASCIS, and that, that's what we see in B. So we know it's parakeratosis <coughs> because it has this orangish tinge to it. It's orangophilic. And the nuclei themselves have a little bit of pleomorphism, some notch in, and so that's a little atypical. This would be called ASCIS. C is an example of dry in artifact. Um, so it's not uncommon to see dry in artifact, especially on the thin prep along the edges. And the cells kind of balloon up and they tend to look like ASCIS. And you could call it ASCUS, but it's best in that situation to look at the overall picture and kind of stay away from the cells where there's um, air drying. And D is an example of atypical repair. Uh, we know it's repair because it has a stream in appearance, and we have prominent nucleoli, which you get with either repair or invasive lesions. But the cells themselves are very, the nuclei themselves are very large, which uh, is kind of atypical. So these are all examples of ASCUS. Um, so now I want to go into the histologic diagnosis, because just like with cytology, what we call in on histology has changed dramatically over the years. So in the 1930s, 1940s, we divided it into two categories, only two. So it was either carcinoma in situ or not. We would call it dysplasia. And if it, we called it carcinoma in situ, the patient would get a hysterectomy, and if it wasn't carcinoma in situ, uh, the patient would go uh, about their business with no treatment. So that went un uh, uncontested for approximately 40, 50 years, but then came the realization that maybe these patients that were previously calling not carcinoma in situ or just dysplasia need to be treated too. Um, so then we came up with a four-tier system of mild, moderate, and dis uh, severe dysplasia, as well as carcinoma in situ. And just like with cytology, we switched over to SIN1, SIN2, SIN3. And we did this with all of the lower anal, anal genital area. Um, and there's also the two-tier system of using L-cell and H-cell. And currently, we kind of use a hybrid of the two-tier and the three-tier system, and I will go into details of how we do it and why. So this is an example of CIN1. So just like with the cy uh, cytology, you're going to see chorlocytosis. So you're going to see these large cells with large nucleoli and the halo formation with irregular nuclear borders by nucleation, and they kind of look like raisins, or they're raisinoid. Um, they're, and the chorlocytes are usually actually on the surface. They're more superficial in, in the intermediate um, epithelium. But you shouldn't have mitoses higher than one-third of the epithelium, so they should be more basally located. 
And there is basal cell atypia at the lower third of the epithelium too. And that's important to note because most of us, the way we're trained, we're looking at the surface for atypia and cholocytosis. But a lot of the atypia is actually at the base. Um, and in the case of SIN1, it should be limited to the lower third. So SIN2, um, you have basal cell atypia that should be limited to the lower two-thirds of the squamous epithelium. And mitosis should be between one-third and two-thirds of the, the length up, but no higher than two-thirds of the, the um, width of the epithelium. With SIN3, the mitoses will be in the upper third of the squamous epithelium. And the basal cell atypia will also extend up into the upper two-thirds of the ep epithelium. And so some people distinguish, and I, I know um, we sometimes do here, between SIN3 and squamous cell carcinoma in situ. The histologic difference really is with SIN3, you have a very, very thin realm of cells on the surface. So the, it's maturing just slightly on the surface, but just barely. And with carcinoma in situ, there, we, we lose those cells. So this is an example of SIN3, where we still have this very wispy, thin area of cells that uh, look a little like they're trying to mature. Currently, and I copied this from our um, quick text, actually. This is how we diagnose um, cervical um, lesions. So it's either low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and in parentheses, we'll put SIN1, or it's high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and we'll dis distinguish between SIN2 and SIN3. The reason why we do this is because of the last groups. Um, LAST stands for Lower Anogenital Squamous Terminology Group. Um, this was co-sponsored by the CAP and published in the Archives of Pathology in October of 2012. And I recommend reading this uh, paper. It's a very extensive history of cervical dysplasia, as well as uh, the reason why we diagnose it the way we do. This was basically multiple groups of pathologists and uh, gynecologists that got together and did an extensive review of the literature to determine what's best or what is the best practice for diagnosing these lesions. And what they came up with was we should call SIN1 l cell, and SIN2 and SIN3 or h cell. Now, the reason why they did that was because they noticed that SIN1 or, or l cell lesions usually regress or stay the same. They usually don't, the majority of them will not progress to high-grade lesions, um, whereas the SIN2 and SIN3 will uh, more than likely eventually become a higher-grade lesion or even cancer with time. So they thought it was important to separate it because there is a dichromatous separation um, of morphologic designations. So one of the groups, working group two, uh, again, recognized that there is a dichromatous separation of morphologic designations that reflect that there's a transient HPV infection in those patients with the L cell, but the ones that develop H cell and carcinoma have persistent HPV-associated precancer. Typically, again, the L cell lesions are self-limited, and the high-grade lesions have the potential to progress to invasive carcinoma. Another thing that they pointed out was that historically SIN2 has been uh, unreproducible by pathologists. There's a lot of disagreement uh, on what SIN2 is, what one pathologist might call a SIN2, another one might call SIN1 or even SIN3. So there's lower variability between observers, and they thought that maybe if we moved it more to an L cell and an H cell system, there would be uh, improvement in inter-observer um, I guess, observation or diagnosis. Also, the reason why we still point out that it's SIN1, SIN2, SIN3 is because some clinicians still will base their therapy on whether or not it's SIN2 or SIN3. They kind of treat those differently. Like they might, they might observe somebody that has a SIN2 longer than they would a SIN3. Um, so they thought that it would be best if we just go ahead and put 
the the sin in as well as L cell and S H cell. Another thing um, that the working group did was to go over um, biomarkers that can be used for the diagnosis, and there's really two of them. So KI67 is an immunohistochemical stain that's nuclear, and typically uh, in normal epithelium, it should be confined to the lower parabasal cells. And as you have dysplasia, because of the mechanism where the virus uh, integrates into the cell and starts making the cell go out of whack from uh, the cell cycle, you have more proliferation. So in a low-grade lesion, you'll have increased KI67, which can be variable. But in a high-grade lesion, it's, it's significantly increased. So in this image, we have a good example. To the right uh, of the squamous epithelium, you have a high-grade lesion, and you see almost full thickness KI67 involvement in almost every mm -hmm. nucleus. But on the left, where you have normal epithelium, the KI67 is confined to the lower par parabasal cells. And KI67 can be useful to distinguish um, high-grade from its benign mimics, such as um, atrophy or immature squamous metaplasia. The other immunohistochemical marker, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about P16 later in this presentation, um, P16. So P16 is a nuclear and cytoplasmic um, bio, uh, stain. So P16 um, starts to accumulate in cell as the HPV encoded E7 inactivates RB, um, and it, it basically causes an overexpression of INC4 as well as P16, and E6 works together to block the feedback inhibition. Uh, so P16 accumulates in the cell, and we can stain for the presence of P16, and therefore P16 is a marker of E7 gene activity as well as a surrogate marker for high-grade dysplasia. And the reason why I say high-grade dysplasia is because those high-risk, those high, well, not the high-risk HPVs um, have an increased affinity for retinal blastoma and they're more likely to cause um, accumulation of P16 than your lowest HPVs. So, in essence, uh, positive P16 usually indicates the presence of a high-risk HPV. So going back to the last working group, four, they recognized that there were biomarkers that could be useful in the diagnosis of high-grade dysplasia. So they suggested that P16 should be used in cases where we want to separate H cell from its benign mimics, such as at atrophy, immature metaplasia, repair, or in some cases, tangential sectioning. Um, another thing, since there isn't um, a lot of inter-observer reproducibility with SIN2, we're trying to diagnose less SIN2 cases and either put them into more of a SIN3 or a SIN1. So they suggested the use of P16 to try to either push it into SIN3 or back down and put it into SIN1. In other words, if you have a lesion that you think might be SIN2 and is P16 positive, call it H cell SIN3. Uh, if it's negative, you could still call it SIN2 or try to back it down and call it SIN1. Uh, P16 can also be used if there's any sort of professional disagreements um, over a possible interpretation of H cell. Again, if it's positive, you're leaning more toward an H cell than you are an, a an L cell. But, and I'm glad they pointed this out, um, they don't, they, they recommend men not to use P16 routinely if there isn't H cell. So if it's a really obvious L cell, don't do P16. The reason being, sometimes L cells can still stain for P16, but it's still an L cell if it has your typical corallocytes and mitoses are limited to the bottom. Um, also, if it's uh, a straightforward H cell, there's no point in doing a P16 because you're going to call it an H cell anyway. So um, you should do it mainly for the cases in which you're thinking SIN2 or if there's a disagreement or if you think it could be a mimic. 
And one of the reasons is the cost. Yeah. So this is actually what we bill here at the University of Minnesota. Um, so the technical charge is 229 the professional charge is 176 for a total charge of $405. And this takes us, what, five seconds to look at? Um, <laughs> maybe 10, maybe 10. Well, okay, two, yes. And uh, unfortunately, the way medicine is heading right now, n not everybody's insurance will cover all these costs from the lab. So there's a potential that this cost might be carried on to the patient. So if you can help the patient, if, if you think it's just an L cell, there's no point in billing them an extra $405. Or if it's an H cell and they're going to go to colposcopy anyway, what's, what, there's no point. So um, we should try to limit the use of P16 until, uh, unless we absolutely have to. Um, this is a cool diagram I borrowed from Dr. Khalifa that shows the uh, immunohistochemical stains, uh, P16 and KI67. So on the left, we have our high-grade lesion. And on H&E, &E, you can honestly tell that it's high-grade. So now if you were doing a case like this, you wouldn't order a P16. But if you were to, what you would get would be the image um, below that, which shows everything is stained. So we have what we call block positivity for P16, both nuclear and cytoplasmic. And below that, you can see that the KI67 is increased as well. Uh, now, in the middle, you can see how atrophy can look like high grade. But if we do the P16 and the KI67, the P16 is negative, and the KI67 only shows a couple of sporadic nuclei that are stained. And, and again, with immature squamous metaplasia, another mimic of um, high grade dysplasia, P16 is negative, and KI67 is low. So I thought this was an interesting study, and I also recently found out that uh, a couple of years ago, I believe Jana, Sammy, and the cytology fellow here, CJ, did a study about um, implementation of KI67 and P16. But this is uh, a study, it, it was titled, Effect of Lower Anal Genital Squamous Terminology Recommendations on the Use of P16 Immunohistochemistry, probably the longest title I've ever seen. But basically, this was an institution that wanted to look and see what happens when you implement the recommendations um, of P16 use by the last working group four. And those were the, that was that table of recommendations I listed earlier. So some of the things that the working group four did say was that if you start using immunohistochemistry stains, well, naturally, you're going to increase costs but maybe it could potentially be off balance by decreased excisional procedures, but that was just a theory. Um, they also estimated that 10% of biopsies that would have previously been diagnosed as SIN2 would be stained, uh, and, uh, as well as 10% of problematic SIN1 cases. So the number of stain size should be less than 25% altogether, was what they came up with. So in this study, um, the pathologist implemented the last recommendations on the use of P16 in July of 2012, um, and they did cases. Um, they didn't do cases that were either negative or sin one. So this is basically um, their findings. So they noticed that the use of P16 increased significantly over implementation of the last criteria. And it, um, overall, it went from 3.3% to 13.9% of cases being stained for P16. There is also an increase in cervical biopsies interpreted as high grade, but it went from 15.4 to 17.6. Uh, and it increased mostly in the specimens from patients in a young, younger age group, the 15 to 24 age range. Um, the the low-grade diagnoses were stable, which you su should suspect because... Uh, if you follow the criteria, you shouldn't do P16 stain, and if it's an obvious low grade, low grade. So of course, the ELSO diagnosis was stable, um, but also negative interpretations decreased. So to summarize that story, uh, that study, there was a consistent increase in high grade diagnosis. 
Um, the pathologists who use P16 immunohistochemistry more frequently to separate CIM1 and 2 before they, the whole department started implementing the last recommendations had only a modest increase in high, uh, H cell results because they were already used to the stain and how to interpret it. Um, so, and there is no consistent pattern seen in the tendency of the pathologist to increase or decrease the frequency of negative or low-grade diagnosis. What they did notice, though, though, was that the utilization of P16 may be increased in diagnostic accuracy. Um, so the two pathologists um, who were the most experienced, they decided to call the gold standard for their study, and they compared these two pathologists to the other less experienced pathologists, and they noticed that the HCO rates of the pathologists after they started using P16 uh, started to move closer up uh, toward those of the more experienced pathologists. So just to go over the molecular testing, um, since we have switched over to conven from conventional PAPs to liquid base, one of the advantages of a liquid base PAP is that any of the residual fluid left over in the test can be used for molecular testing. The ALT study, which stands for the ASCAS l cell triage study, is why uh, we can do HPV tests on uh, thin prep specimens. <coughs> Basically, uh, the FDA approved um, use of HPV as part of the diagnosis of cervical dysplasia because of the study, and it was a multi-center randomized trial comparing sensitivity and specificity of three management strategies for detection of H cell. So they compared cytology alone to HPV molecular testing using the hybrid capture 2 platform as well as to immediate coposcopy. And their main conclusion was that the hybrid capture 2 had high sensitivity and specificity for detection of these high grade lesions. So the FDA approved HPV molecular testing as a result of this study. Now, the other platform I think that's becoming more, more common is the COBUS HPV test. And so this was approved in 2011 by the FDA for co-testing women 30 years of age and older, as well as an ASCUS triage um, as a result of this study called the Athena HPV trial, and I'll go into details about that. Unlike the hybrid capture, which only evaluates for the presence of the high-risk HPV um, 16 and 18, the COBIS HPV test actually evaluates the presence of 16, 18, as well as non-16, 18 high-risk HPV genotypes like your 31, 33, 35, and so forth. Um, and COBIS HPV test has also been approved since 2014 for primary screening for cervical cancer as well as a result of this study. So I naturally have to study, uh, talk about this study. So um, currently in the U.S., HPV testing is recommended um, in the triage of women with ASCAS, as well as co-testing in women 30 years of age and above. But in some countries like Australia and Netherlands, um, HPV testing is already and has been used for years as primary screening. And I'd also like to point out, uh, just as an interesting point, Australia and the Netherlands are countries that have national screening programs. Uh, we actually don't have one in the U.S. What happens is a patient in the U.S. has to know that they need a PAP, and it's like a, it's a screening by opportunity of the patient showing up or maybe their doctor suggesting it. But in Australia and Nether in, in the Netherlands, they actually will, like, put patients on the list and they'll start sending them out notifications and they have a, a database where they keep track of all of the results too. So the research there is really good for uh, HPV as well as cervical dysplasia. But so going back to the Athena study, um, this was performed because they, they wanted to determine which HP, HPV positive patients would be referred to coposcopy if primary screen is performed as well as to see how well primary screening in, in the U.S. would perform. So the Athena study um, was a large cohort study 
uh, trying to, uh, in basically it was a three-year perspective study that began in 2008. Um, they enrolled subjects above the age of 21, but they only wanted to use patients above the age of 25 since HPV testing technically shouldn't be used in anybody below the age of 25. So the study itself evaluated primary screening with the COBUS HPV test in women 25 years and above. Um, they did have some exclusionary criteria, like if the patient was pregnant, naturally the patient was excluded from the study, and if they had any abnormalities on the initial cytology, they were also they also exited the study. So they examined different triage strategies implementing HPV testing. Um, cytology with HPV performed only for ASCUS. A hybrid strategy using cytology in women, um, 25 to 29, and cytology in HPV coast testing in women above the age of 30, which is basically what we use. We use more of a hybrid strategy. Um, and the women would undergo a coposcopy at the beginning of the study uh, if there were any abnormalities and they were invited to do an exit coposcopy as well. As those um, with HPV 16-18, if they use um, the strategy of HPV primary um, screening, received coposcopy, and those that had non-16-18 went to cytology, and if there was an ASCUS diagnosis on cytology, then they would go to colposcopy. So the women who underwent colposcopy and didn't have a SIN2, and, and when I put SIN2, I mean SIN2, SIN3, or carcinoma. So if they didn't have a significant lesion, they were eligible for a three-year follow-up in which the patients underwent annual examinations with cytology and HPV. And those of ASCUS would undergo colposcopy. So, again, any patient with significant uh, diagnosis were exited from the study. And what they noted was that HIV primary screening of women above the age of 25 had the highest adjusted sensitivity over three years for high-grade um, dysplasia. And cytology had the highest specificity, which we already knew. Unfortunately, primary, um, and this, this study gave HPV primary a fairly good specificity because other studies have shown it to be as low as 25%. But HPV primary screening has higher negative predictive value than cytology, but it's the same as a hybrid strategy. So at the end of the Athena study, this is the algorithm on the right that they recommended that they could use, um, if they use COVID HPV as primary screen, and if the patient had 16, 18 positivity, that's your high-risk HPV, they would go to colposcopy. If they were negative for HPV, then they could be followed up, and they say in the study three to five years, even though this is only a three-year study. And um, if they have any of the non-16, 18 HPVs, they would go to cytology. If the cytology was negative, they'd go back into the follow-up algorithm. If it was ASCUS or above, then they would go to colposcopy. So I wanted to pull some data from here just to give you a little bit of a timeline of where we're heading with HPV tests. As you can see, 2006, 3,000 HPV tests, and in 2016, 25,000. So we've been using HPV um, like most labs in the U.S., there's been an increase in the use of HPV molecular testing because it's, it is useful, especially since we have approval for uh, co-testing in women age 30 and above, and in an ASCUS uh, scenario, a positive HPV would help us triage the patients better uh, and then, you know, not knowing. And on the right, um, it's just a diagram of how many cervical cases um, we've had. So I decided to take a look at how useful primary screening would actually be in our wastebasket categories of ASCUS and AIS. And the reason AIS is because AIS is also caused by HPV, your high-risk HPVs, but there's been less data on the effect of uh, HPV uh, molecular testing with AIS. I actually, I, I don't know if there are any great studies on if it would be useful for these glandular lesions. So I looked at the cytology-histology HPV correlation database 
from a period of time of one year. Basically, it was picked because this was when uh, the Cobos, uh, Cobos uh, HPV molecular testing was implemented. So I looked at uh, 130,648 PEPs, and I looked at the cytology and the corresponding histology. Um, and, and just so you know, the, the PEPs and the patient's cervical biopsies were all looked at board-certified pathologists or gynecologic pathologists. Um, I did some basic statistical analysis as well as a chi-square test to compare the cases positive for HPV 16-18 versus your lower risk non-16-18 cases. So I just wanted to throw this in here. Um, this is the CAP benchmarking data for this period of time. And the reason for the benchmarking data, uh, and, and the CAP comes out with this every year, is we we want to make sure we're not an outlier lab. You want to make sure you're not that lab that's calling ask us way too much. So uh, if you look at the areas that are highlighted, both with the thin prep and the sure path, you can see that the reporting range is anywhere from the 10th percentile to the 7th percentile, which is uh, in an acceptable range for the CAP. So I'm just pointing out that the, the diagnoses are um, pretty in key with what the CAP recommends, and we're not, this wasn't an outlier lab. Um, some of the data of, of those 130,000 PAPs, these were the ones that had either ASCAS or uh, AGC on cytology and then went on to have a biopsy as well. So when I did my calculations, the sensitivity, if you use HPV primary testing, would be 91%. And, and we know sensitivity for HPV molecular testing is high. We've known it for a while. It's higher than the PAP test, but the specificity is 25%. Again, there are studies showing that uh, HPV molecular testing has uh, a low specificity because, again, 40% uh, of Americans have HPV. So just the presence of HPV doesn't necessarily mean you have a high-grade lesion. But I want you to pay attention mainly to these two numbers. These are the, the lesions that would have been called ASCUS or AGC on cytology that had negative, they were negative for HPV, um, but found to have either high-grade AIS or carcinoma. So if, if we would have done primary screening on these cases, they would have been missed. So there's a 12.2% HPV negative rate for high-grade cases in this cohort. Um, the high-risk HPV genotypes, especially 16, 18, are strongly associated with high-grade and AIS on follow-up biopsies. And of course, we knew that based upon uh, previous literature that the high-risk HPVs are more likely to cause HCL or be correspondent with HCL and AIS. Uh, mix, mixed infection with HPV 16, 18, and non-16, 18. So there are some patients that actually have multiple different strands of HPV. So in those patients that had mixed infe infections with your 16, 18, and your non-16, 18, we wanted to look at whether or not having multiple HPV infections would cause more high-grade lesions, and it made no difference compared to those that just had 16, 18 alone. Since, um, since I did this, there are increasingly more studies coming out um, that have pointed out ne uh, HPV negative cases with significant lesions, your high cell, uh, H cell lesions. So um, the study on the top uh, was very similar to mine, and they reported a rate of 12.2%. Again, very similar. Uh, the one on the bottom. Um, reported that 8.8% of lesions that would have been called ASK-H on cytology were HPV negative. So we have to talk a little bit about the future of cervical cancer screening. Currently there are three vaccinations available for cervical cancer. And I remember when this first came out, there were two and it was only offered to girls between the age of, I believe, 9 and 26. It still has an age limit between 9 and 26, but um, we now offer it to boys as well because, you know, 
they get they get HPV in equal rates as girls anyway, and they're also at risk of other cancers like <coughs> anal cancers. Uh, and this will ha uh, help to have sort of a herd immunity and decrease the numbers of uh, cervical cancer all around. So your basic ones, um, your your all of them cover 16 and 18, but the Gardasil 9 covers both um, a few high risk, low risk, and intermediate risk HPVs. Um, so what do we do now that a whole population of, of people are now, they're adults. The, these kids that got the immunizations when they were smaller or younger are now entering the screening algorithm. What do we do now? Um, because screening is a very fluid thing and um, we don't know. So. This study that I have, have listed at the bottom is the cervical cancer screening and women vaccinated against HPV. This is an Italian study, um, and, and they did a consensus, and they recommended that maybe instead of starting screening at 21, well, in Italy it's actually 25 where they start screening. Uh, in the U.S. it's 21, though. But instead of doing it at 25, they were recommending maybe if the patient's been immunized, 30 would be fine. But nobody knows what's going to happen, and there's going to be a lot of research concerning how the screening algorithm is going to change with this population. Um, some of you guys might have noticed this recently in the news last week. This was all over the Internet. This was published in the New York Times. Um, there is... A wider racial gap found in cervical cancer deaths than expected. We knew there, that there was one, but it's wider than anybody expected. And also this study that um, was published, well, they didn't publish the entire study, but the, the study that they referenced in the New York Times also shows that cervical cancer is higher than we expected. It's kind of on the rise. And the study itself um, that they talked about in the New York Times and other sources on the Internet is the hysterectomy corrected cervical cancer mortality rates. So this is actually old data, but they did some corrections with the, um, the number of cases that received hysterectomy because there's a disparity and a difference between uh, Caucasian women and then black women. And when they corrected for that, the mortality rate for black women was 10.1 per 100,000, but 4.7 per 100,000 for white women, which is a difference of two. And of course, the paper went into details about how it was economically driven and also a lot of patients weren't being offered um, standard care. They were, uh, they were less likely to be, to be offered standard care. Um, care for cervical cancer. Um, I, I wanted to throw this out there because the CAP actually does sponsor something called C Test and Treat. Um, you have to apply for this program, but basically it's a day where the cytopathologists and the gy gynecologists get together and they provide free PAPs and free uh, breast examinations for, in, in, in dig I guess, um, just anybody, actually. And, you know, people will drive from hundreds of miles away to get this treatment or, or to get testing if they can't afford it. So there are um, some opportunities out there to, to hopefully decrease cervical cancer. And I lived in rural Al Alabama, close to the Tennessee border for a year, and I know that there's... There's just not a lot of education about cervical cancer and pap tests. I know um, there was a study done in Mississippi um, where they went around and just surveyed people and asked them, hey, what is a pap, why do you do a pap test? And the majority of people thought it's for STDs. They didn't know it was a screening test for cancer. So I think there's just a general lack of knowledge right now. And we need to be a little bit more vocal about why we do a pap test. And also, the, today is February 1st, I know, but January was Cervical Health Awareness Month. And I'd like to give some acknowledgments to everybody that helped me. Um, Dr. Khalifa, Tanya Jordan, Jana, and Sammy. I have references. And just because my litter. Um.
Yes. So, um, so in your study, uh, approximately twelve percent of uh, the women with high grade uh, in terms of HSIL, um, approximately twelve percent um, were HPV negative. But that was that because the testing, the cohorts was just for sixteen and eighteen. Oh no no okay so. And uh, the ones that were HPV negative, we actually had the biopsies. So we, we knew they were high grade, we knew they were cancer, the HPV was negative. So they were negative for 1618 as well as non 1618, they were just completely negative. And I, I think I'd like to also add that HPV testing, even though it's really sensitive, how do we know that the, uh, the, the material that they received was um, adequate for testing because the internal control is actually a, a molecule that's found in all cells. So maybe the correct cells, the, the cells that would be dysplastic, aren't even in the container. We just have some form of human in it. So it would register as adequate or satisfactory. But control positive and negative control negative. So, so help me here, though. So uh, are you saying that the in time, we thought that all uh, cervical squamous uh, neoplasia was HPV driven. Yes. And and the one you know non HPV driven, which you see in African American women, was the um, adenoid cystic carcinomas. Okay, which are very rare. Mm -hmm. So help me understand here: is it possible that there are squamous cell carcinomas of the cervix in females that are not HPV? Absolutely, and there have been studies on it. Um, that's actually more common in postmenopausal women um, that they will be HPV negative. There's also another theory that maybe these p patients used to have HPV and they had enough damage to the cells, but they've um, sort of gotten rid of the infection. Okay, but they still have the, the molecular um, yes. uh, rearrangement that allows progression of the disease. Yes. Okay. When we did a retrospective look of our old test, our PCR and my and my 11, we had, again, similarly, of HPV negative on screen, being positive by hypo, positive by hypocosposcopy for some of the reasons, for high grade infection regions, or for actually HPV based on expression, or for swing of cell carcinoma. But that 12% negativity rate does not hold as far as the negativity rate of truly invasive swing cell it is not zero, but it is rarer than that. So a lot of that detection bias is due to lack of detection. It's due to as the HPV integrates into the squamous cells, it may actually lose components of the genome, which are used for the genotyping, okay. that are actually not even yeah. present anymore as it integrates. So it can contain and it can integrate active B76 and the components of the HPV genome, but it can actually integrate in ways in which it does not. The TCGA studies that looked at squamous cell carcinoma <coughs> and used whole genome sequencing and actually looked for sites of integration, I think it was, again, in the high 90s Got as far it. as okay. the percentage of what HPV integration effects can be found in squamous cell carcinoma. But it is correct that there are a small number for which we don't know. But they actually end up having many of the same different types of um, overall chromosomal abnormalities that, again, we do. Dysregulation of um, the RD pathway, the cell cycle pathway, and generally lead to inactivation of the disruption of the genetic genotype and the protein standard of the two slightly different pathways. Genomic pathways. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, so are the HPV uh, <coughs> phenotypically negative uh, cancers still P16 positive? P16 positive? Ooh. That's what Andy. Hmm. I'd have to go back and look at the TCJ, whether they did anything. Now, it wouldn't be IHC, it would be like those protein arrays or something like that. But at least from looking at um, those types of data, I, for some of those that are negative, I think it would probably be a mixed bag. And in some cases, it would seem to be into a deletion. Um, but for, for 
Yes. Would you, if you, let's say you have decided, based on your study, that you're going to get screened every year for cervical cancer for the rest of your life, would you believe that pre-testing, that a, 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 a pathway of, test, uh, of screening should start with HPV or or is, is cytology, as far as you're concerned, a local standard and so um. I think at some point in a woman's lifetime, they should always have uh, cytology because this is this is enough of a doubt that there could be something there. So yeah, you could potentially use HPV primary screening, but that begs the question of at what point in time would you do the cytology? Because I know this study recommended three to five years, but the you know there were some problems with the study. Um, one of them being, how can you recommend five years if the study is only three years long? Um, <laughs> There is also a, there is al also a very uh, large conflict of interest with the study itself because Roach, um, the maker of Cobus, uh, sponsored it and it was tested at the uh, at the Roach labs too. So there there were problems with the initial study. Okay, so back again, do you think that based on the <coughs> with your data and what you presented to us, do you think that? A, a, a screening protocol that starts with HPV testing is appropriate, or should, should that just be bad and go back? To oh man, that's a hard question. Um, okay, Because <laughs> I mean, I've seen I've seen high grade lesions in nineteen twenty year olds. You never know I, if primary screening HPV screening would catch those. I mean, a lot of those. Virgins. She did a virgin study. We figured out how many sex 